well-being, it's not a word. It's an action. We are all responsible not only to ourselves but to each other. So with that in mind, I'd like to ask you a question. Would you consider yourself to be an adaptive leader, one who actually takes actions for their people? We're actually all aware that the UN had identified good health and well-being as the third SDG goal. So today, more than ever, we can actually safely say that there is a desperate need for us to actually pause and really begin to address this as a conscious leader. The pandemic has now actually taken well-being to a very different level. We are all conscious of the impact on humanity over the last two years. However, we are yet to really address it and how we actually each are going to contribute to remedy the situation is still an unknown. Well, here's the reality. We're still unaware of the extent of the past two years and the impact that it has actually had on our well-being. In 2018, the International Organization for Standardization, who is the World Federation of National Standards Body, otherwise known as ISO, began to recognize the need to incorporate well-being and mental health as part of the global OHS standards. The purpose of the global standards was to actually provide a framework for managing risk and opportunities. The aim and intended outcomes are actually to prevent work-related injuries and ill health within the workforce and to provide safe and healthy workplaces. Consequently, it is critically important for organisations to eliminate hazards and minimise risk by taking effective preventative and proactive measures. So where are we with that? You know, despite the calling from the UN and all the standardisation suggestions, we still seem to be hesitant in actually taking action. We continue to operate in an environment where we're still actually struggling to recognise mental health and well-being as a critical element to living a fulfilled life and to actually feel safe at work and in our communities. There are several aspects that really have actually contributed to where we are today. But dwelling on them and how we actually got here aren't going to solve the problem, but taking action will. The magnitude of the problem is real. And I want to actually share some statistics with you to show you how alarming things are for your people, for you, for your loved ones, because the reality is, is that we're all in this together. If you are running a business, an organisation, managing a team, and you recognise that your people are actually disengaged, then you've got a problem. Studies actually show us disengaged workers have 37% higher absenteeism, 49% more accidents, and made 60% more errors. Mental health isn't just about what happens to people personally or to their family and friends. It also is impacting the economy. It affects every organisation across the globe. It has a huge ripple effect. So how big of an issue is mental health and wellbeing? Well, the impact is at least $12 billion in a small country like Australia. So how much more is it on a global basis? We are only starting to see some of the effects. This is a long-term issue, so let's not play the short-term game. 
The Productivity Commission established or estimated, in fact, that all mental illness, not just anxiety, costs the economy between $200 billion and $220 billion a year. So how are we contributing to that as leaders? Well, research actually shows that workplaces actually cause between $15.8 billion and $17.4 billion of that cost. You see, anxiety is only part of that, but it is a significant part. So we know absolutely that we are looking at costs of tens of billions of dollars from people who are actually working for us. And we are actually contributing to those costs because our workforce is being inhibited by actually being able to do the job to the best of their abilities. So are we actually pausing to recognise that? Absenteeism alone actually costs the economy $9.6 billion a year, while presenteeism costs $7 billion. Presenteeism is actually a term that means that you show up for work, but you're really not capable of doing your job. You're not able to produce the output, the quality or the quantity that you would normally be expected to do because you're paralysed by anxiety or stress or other mental health issues. Think about what's going on in your businesses. Think about what's going on for the people around you. It's estimated that about $11 billion is actually paid in income support payments to people who can't work because of poor mental health. These are all alarming facts, yet we procrastinate to take action because we can't always see what's truly happening for our people. Or maybe we actually aren't looking for it. Maybe we're just waiting until someone collapses or has an actual breakdown. To move forward, we need to crack through the surface and we need to be part of the solution. So let's actually acknowledge that, you know, we actually need to bring expertise in. People that are familiar and understand psychological health and well-being. We also need to recognise that our human resources is not the solution because they need the support too. Let's recognise that we, executives, board members, C-suite, we're actually not immune. And let's also recognise that there were contributing factors that actually started before pre-pandemic, and these actually include generational gaps and the expectations that were either set or assumed from each of these areas. So to move forward, we need to begin to understand that human capital is actually about people. We know that people are actually at the core of every business, so let's take measured steps to ensure their safety mentally, socially, as well as physically. We need to ensure that we create an environment that not only allows people to survive, but enables them to thrive. Creating these environments needs support to bridge the gaps and to actually create a trust environment within the workplace and within our community. We actually need to invest time and money to transform what was to what needs to be. So where do we go from here? What are some of the objectives that we can actually aim to achieve? I outline them in five key areas. The first one is actually to, to actually define psychologically safety environments. Well-being 
as a concept that we acknowledge, that we recognise and that we respect. The second is to explain the framework that we're all going to actually operate within. And the third one, and this is so critical, is actually to make sure that we have alignment. Alignment with what we're actually saying with the team. The language is so critical in this process. And most importantly, that we all understand the concept of the framework that we're all going to be working towards. We then need to prepare ourselves and the team to take those measured steps in achieving success, not just for ourselves, but as a collective. And most importantly, the fifth thing is we need to be motivated. It's not just about saying that we will do something. It's not just about taking the action. It's actually about being motivated to see us all succeed and to implement the action plan. We need to increase psychological safety and well-being within the workplace. Otherwise, it won't matter. We won't have alignment and people will be able to see straight through it. So as I actually come to wrap up, I want to actually ask each of you, are you going to be the leaders of organisations that cultivate cultural architects who are prepared to take action in shaping a better tomorrow? by increasing mental health conditions and well-being in the workplace and in your community. I'm Kathy DeMarcos from Solutions to You, and I am actually committed to accelerating health and well-being for humanity by developing the skills of adaptive leaders who are ready to champion the third UN SDG goal of mental health and well-being through the development of psychological safety. Will you join me by taking action too?